Okay, happy Thursday. We're going to talk about the Middle Ages Part 2. And let's talk about Western Europe in the early Middle Ages. We're actually going to talk about the Middle Ages this time. Um, first of all, time period. What are we talking about? Uh, roughly 500 to 1500. That thousand year period, that's the Middle Ages, and it's kind of broken up into three parts. The, the early, the middle, and the high or the early high and the late Middle Ages is what it's really called. So the early Middle Ages, uh, what is it made up of? Well, it's the breakdown of Roman power. Rome fell in 476 AD, and Europe has to figure out what to do after Rome's no longer there. The Christian church that we talked about on Tuesday, it's going to get stronger, and it's going to grow. And then there's going to be this new society that's based on Roman ideals that are left over. This new Christianity that is growing stronger and stronger and stronger. And the idea of Germanic society. Now, what is Germanic society? Well, there are people called Germans. They're not Germans like the country of Germany today because Germany doesn't exist until the 1880s. But they are people who are a cultural group that share a lot of similarities that live in Germanic territories. Uh, these Germanic societies, they have three social classes. There's the nobility, there's freemen, and then there's this very weird group called serfs. Serfs are non-free, but they're non-slave. They're peasants in a way, but they're not. But you have these three social classes, the nobles, the freemen, and the serfs. The German people, they're fierce warriors. They're not well organized. They're known for eating, drinking, and gambling, and fighting. And they gain their prestige through war. They gain their power through war. And great warriors, they earn fan clubs that follow them around. And we also have, you know, the rise of Christianity. And Christianity is going to be broken down into three parts. You're going to have the people, you're going to have the priests, and you're going to have the bishops. The people are going to be seen as the believers. The priests are going to be the ones that serve the religion. And the bishops are going to be the ones who are going to teach the relationship and the people and the priests and how it all works together. Uh, there are five bishops. I mentioned them last time. Uh, it's the Bishop of Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. All five of those bishops are supposed to be equal, but as I mentioned previously, the Bishop of Rome becomes the first among equals. The Bishop of Rome and Constantinople have a falling out, and then you end up with that great schism. Early Christianity is based around monks, and it's based around monasteries. Uh, monks, they have no families, they've got no business ties, and they completely devote their life to, to Christian, to Christianity. Uh, the monasteries become repositories for knowledge in Europe because it's one of the few places where books are collected and books are copied. So the monks are going to live in the monasteries. The monasteries are going to become the center of European knowledge and the center of European life. And in a lot of ways, Christianity is going to become the glue that holds Europe together. It's going to operate not just as a religion, but in a lot of ways, it's going to operate as a government too. Now, your first big name of the Middle Ages that you have to know is Charlemagne. Charlemagne, also known as Charles, also known as Carolus, he is the king of the Franks, and he becomes the king of the Franks in 768. There's a little bit of a story behind this. His dad was named Pepin the Short. Pepin the Short steals a kingdom from another set of people and gives that kingdom to his two sons, Charlemagne and Carlman. Carlman dies, and Charlemagne becomes the one who gets it all. Now, this is going to be a big kingdom. It's going to stretch from modern-day France to modern-day Poland. In fact, France and Frank, you might notice a little bit of similarity. The Franks become the French. Now, this is going to be the first large-scale European government since Rome fell. So, 768, this new empire is created. This new kingdom, if you will. 
and it's the first big European government since 476 AD. Now Charlemagne is a pretty well-rounded guy. He's a warrior, he's a politician, he's a patron of the arts, he's a patron of religion, he likes education, he's very well respected. Uh, he himself can't read, but he makes sure that people around him can read and he hires people that can read to him. He's able to speak many different languages, even though he can't write them. His empire is very decentralized. He is going to base his empire on personal relationships. Uh, he's going to travel through his kingdom. He's going to visit wealthy people. He's going to ask for support. He's going to go to somebody and say, what can I do for you? Uh, what do you need? How can I help you? His personality is really going to get people to want to follow him. Charlemagne is going to get so powerful that in the year 800, the Pope is going to crown him the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, this is all kind of funny because Charlemagne, he just thinks of himself as King of the Franks. He's nothing more than that. And he's not holy. He's not of the church. He's not Roman. He's French. And he's not an emperor. He's just a king. But the Holy Roman Emperor is going to be the title he's given in 800 by the Pope. And a country called the Ro Holy Roman Empire is going to form around this, and it's going to exist in one form of an, or another until about 1400, even though it was never a true empire. So this is a real big ironic title that just kind of means nothing, actually. What is more important, though, is Charlemagne is given credit for what becomes the Carolingian Renaissance. And this Carolingian Renaissance happens before the actual renaissance um, charlemagne he's going to reform the church and improve the church he's going to create a version of the christian bible that is more closely in tune to uh, the times and he's going to add liberal arts to education so he is uh, one of the reasons that you today study history and english and and uh, stuff like that now, we've talked about feudalism before, especially when we talked about China. Uh, feudalism is going to become the basis of European life, and you're familiar with this. This is knights and shining armor, damsels in distress, lords, ladies, kings, queens. So you, you know a little bit about this, even if you don't realize it. But uh, generally speaking, in feudalism, you have a lord who's also a landlord, and he gives some of his land away to a vassal. That vassal then agrees to provide the Lord protection and agrees to give the Lord tax money. Now, the king is the top Lord. He gives away the most land. Uh, when you are given land by a Lord, you can choose to keep all that land for yourself or you could divide it up more and you yourself could become a smaller Lord and have a vassal underneath you. So that means you can be both a Lord and a vassal at the same time. Now, the land that is controlled becomes known as a manor. And in the manor system, there's a serf, sometimes known as a peasant, who works the land. That serf can also be used as a soldier. Maybe the lord needs protection. Uh, your serfs will go and fight for the lord. You don't actually do the fighting yourself. Now, just like you as a vassal, you have to pay taxes to your lord. The serfs have to pay taxes to the lord, too. Now, here's where serfs are really, really kind of hard to understand. Serfs are stuck on the land, but they're not slaves. The serfs cannot leave the land they live on, but they also can't be sold. I think of it almost like dirt in the field. You cannot possibly remove all of the dirt in the field. That dirt cannot be carried away. That dirt cannot be removed. You cannot sell individual grains of dirt. But you can sell the land overall, and when you send, sell the land overall, all the dirt on the land goes to that new owner. So that's the best kind of comparison I can get. A serf, they're not a slave, but they're not free. They can't be sold by themselves, but they can be bought with the land they live on. All right, we got the High Middle Ages, roughly 1000 to 1300 A.D., and probably the biggest thing to know about the High Middle Ages is the creation of incorporated cities. Today, most cities are incorporated. 
Uh, but that really starts around 1000. Um, the reason cities would want to become incorporated is because they could have a direct relationship with the king instead of the local lord. So if the city wants to be incorporated, they can make their own decisions. They can control their own affairs. They can make their own laws. Uh, they don't have to ask permission from the local lord anymore. And to become incorporated, the members of the city or members of the town, they have to pay the lord for any revenue they would lose. And then they have to pay the king for the right of incorporation, basically the right to do business with the king. So being incorporated is not a cheap thing. It's very expensive. But once again, if you do incorporate, you can control your own affairs. You can make your own laws. And most importantly, you can set up your own trade guilds, your own trade groups. And these guilds still exist today. You may have a friend who's a carpenter, an electrician, a lineman for like the power company. Those are all guilds. Uh, you have apprentices. Apprentices, they study with masters and learn the craft. You have a journeyman who works for a master, but they don't need everyday supervision. Basically, a journeyman will do the work and then a master will come along and check to make sure the work was done right. Once a journeyman le learns everything that they can learn, they can take a, a test and then they themselves could potentially become a master if they master their trade. And once somebody becomes a master, then they can take on apprentices and they can teach new people how to do the job. Another big part of this high middle age is a struggle between the church and the state. Uh, by the time we get to the year 1000, churches are, well, the church, because there's only the Catholic church. It's very powerful, but kings and lords by this time have become very powerful too. So there is a competition on who is the one that actually has the power. Is it the church that's in charge, or is it the lords that's in charge, is it the kings in charge? And the best place to see this is with church land itself. A local lord might give the land, might give some of his land to a church. And then the local lord might have a church built. But they would also want to control the affairs of that church. Uh, a local lord would say, I gave you the land, I gave you the money, I built you the building, I get to say what happens here. But the church has a completely different point of view. The church is going to say, thanks for the land, thanks for the building, but we answer to a higher power. This is a religious establishment. We answer to a higher being than you. So there's this, there's this real struggle over who is actually in charge. They might want to know why, why would the Lord voluntarily give up their land to the church? Well, it's prestigious. I have so much money. I can give part of my land away and I can give it to the church. It's also going to look good if the church has a nice building on your land. It's also going to give the poor a place to stay. One of the tenets of Christianity is give me your poor, give me your weak. And if the Lord builds a church, then he can send the poor people to that church and the church pays for the poor people instead of the Lord. It also brings in tourism money. Uh, there are big dollars spent on people traveling to see churches in the Middle Ages. Uh, religious relics would be in these churches. Uh, the, the head of St. John the Baptist, the, the pinky toe of St. Peter, whatever it might be. People would spend a lot of tourism money to go to these churches and see these, these Christian relics that may or may not have been real. Now, kings attempt to control bishops, kings attempt to control the church, and it leads to this big event called the Investiture Controversy. In the Investiture Controversy, there's an argument over who actually has control of what. And ultimately, it's decided that there's going to be the formation of separate spheres. Uh, the Pope is going to get control of all matters concerning salvation. 
The Pope is going to get control of all matters concerning heaven. The Pope is going to be given control over spiritual matters, religious matters. Kings and emperors, they're going to get control over political matters because they're the ones with political authority. They're the ones with physical armies. So it's decided that we're going to separate the world into these two separate spheres. The High Middle Ages also begins the long road to modern education like we have today. Although, uh, you know, with everything going on, this is really modern with, you know, online instruction and everything. I don't know if these three guys ever thought this was going to happen, but... Uh, the three guys you have, the first one is Anselm of Canterbury, uh, 1033 to 1109 is when he lived. Uh, his big thing is, uh, he taught that one's intellect could observe the world, and by observing the world around you could understand the Christian God. Uh, his thinking was, if people can imagine and perceive the existence of a great being, then a great being must exist. The world is so great, there's so much stuff around us, something or someone had to create it. And the only thing that could have created this magnificent world we live on is the Christian God. Now, Bernard of Clairvoy, uh, 1090 to 1153, uh, he's going to say that logic can be used to enhance spirituality. If you use logic to enhance your spirituality, then that will lead you closer to God and closer to the kingdom of heaven. And then the third guy, Peter Abelard, uh, he's going to live from 1079 to 1142. He's going to say, you don't need to teach religion and logic together. You can teach logic on its own without religion. And this idea that logic is important, that you can teach logic without religion, is going to become the way that education is done. This type of education using logic becomes very popular. It leads to the formation of modern schools, modern education, and modern universities. All right, the Crusades. But before I do the Crusades, here is your word of the day. The word of the day is cat, C-A-T. I have a cat that is annoying me right now, trying to get into my secret lair, and it will not stop. So cat, C-A-T. All right, the Crusades. Uh, they're going to go from 1095 to 1271, and there are quite a few Crusades to talk about. I'm going to try to go through it fairly quickly. Uh, that investiture controversy that was supposed to solve who had control of what, it really didn't. Um, even though the struggle between church and state was supposed to be solved, it really wasn't. And it's during the Crusades that it becomes really, really obvious. Now, the Crusades, they don't come out of nowhere. It has to do with uh, the Islamic takeover of the Middle East. There's a group of people called the Seljuk Turks. They take over what's known as the Holy Land, Jerusalem, Syria, that part of the world. And they begin to treat religious pilgrims very poorly. Uh, today, making a pilgrimage is not part of Christianity, but at one point it was. At one point, every good Christian was supposed to go eat to either Rome or Jerusalem. That's been taken out now. But during the 900s, you were still supposed to go to Jerusalem if you were Christian. Now, the Muslims who were in charge of the area before the Turks, they would allow Christian pilgrims to come in. They were people of the book. They were well respected. But Seljuk Turks, they start taxing pilgrims and making pilgrims feel unimportant or uncomfortable. They don't stop religious pilgrimage. They still let Christians in, but they don't treat them well. And they're hoping that by treating these Christians so badly, the Christians will stop coming. Add to this, the Byzantine emperors were supposed to take care of the Christian pilgrims. But by the time we get to the 900s, the Byzantine Empire is not doing so great. It's starting to weaken and it is starting to go broke. So the Byzantine Empire, they can't afford to help these pilgrims anymore like they're supposed to. So the Byzantine emperor is forced to ask the Catholic Church for help. Well, the guy who was Pope in the early thousands, 
was Pope Urban II. And Pope Urban II, in 1095, he calls for a general crusade to liberate the Holy Land from the, quote, infidels. Now, this idea, there's something in it for everyone. Uh, first of all, if the church can raise an international army, it will show the Pope has real political power and spiritual power. Uh, by raising the crusade, by creating this army, the Pope thinks I can take back control of the real world and I can have control of the spiritual world. I can have everything. Kings go along with it because they can get rid of all their troublemakers. Knights who don't listen, unruly knights who don't behave, go fight. Second sons who are never going to inherit land, go fight. Go make your own inheritance. Go make your own fortune. Peasants who can't afford to pay taxes, go fight and bring me back riches. So kings are going to get something out of this too. They get rid of all their troublemakers. They get rid of all these extra people. And the ones that are left will make those kings stronger. Now the first crusade is fairly successful. In the very, very first crusade, the Pope's army manages to take back Jerusalem. Christian kingdoms are set up throughout the Middle East. The most famous one I can think of off the top of my head is the kingdom of Acre. Uh, but all of these successes, they're temporary. Mostly the reason that the First Crusade works is A, because the Muslim groups are fighting each other, and B, they're not expecting this Christian army to just show up and, and take over out of nowhere. Now in total, there are nine major crusades. Uh, the first one in 1095, the last one in 1291. Uh, some of the more famous crusades, I didn't put them on here, so just listen here. Uh, the third crusade that happens in 1189, it goes on until 1192. So the third crusade is 1189 to 1192. It's also known as the King's Crusade because King Richard II of England is there. King Philip Augustus of France is there and Emperor Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire is there. And by the way, if you have ever seen any version of Robin Hood, my personal favorite is Robin Hood Men in Tights, followed by Disney's Robin Hood. If you have ever seen any version of Robin Hood, this crusade, the third crusade, is the one that's happening during Robin Hood. King Richard is off fighting. Prince John has control. Prince John is working with the Sheriff of Nottingham to take money from the people. Why are they taking money from the people? It's to get King Richard back because he's a prisoner. Another famous crusade happens in 1212. It's called the Children's Crusade. An army of children is raised to march to the Holy Land. It's thought that these children can free the Holy Land from the Muslims. But instead, when the children march to southern France and into Italy, they are sold into slavery. So not everybody has a happy ending there. Now, cathedrals, these are like the number one symbol of, symbol of opulence, the number one symbol of wealth during the high Middle Ages. Uh, just give you an example. During the 1100s, from 1101 to 1199, there's more stone dug up and quarried out of the earth than in all of ancient Egypt. Cathedral building is big business. Just in France alone, this is one country, France alone, between 1180 and 1270, there are 80 cathedrals built and 500 abbeys. An abbey is like a miniature cathedral. That's a lot of stone. That's a lot of work that's being done. And there's a competition between the different cities who can make the best cathedrals. Uh, the very first cathedral that is built for this uh, Middle Ages is the Cathedral at St. Denis. That's in France. It's built in 1144. It is the first Gothic cathedral. Notre Dame, which is fairly recently famous because of that fire in Paris. It's built in 1163. It was originally 114 feet tall. The city of Chartres, 
Uh, Chartres decide they're going to build their own cathedral in 1194. That one's 119 feet tall. So here's a competition. And then the city of Beauvais in 1247, they're going to build an even bigger cathedral. It's 157 feet tall, and it collapses multiple times because it was too tall for the engineering of the day. It was not structurally sound, and every time they tried to rebuild it, it fell down again. Now, there are two types of cathedrals. There's the Romanesque cathedral. That is the right-hand picture there at the bottom. Uh, they're older, round arches, thick walls, stone roofs, small windows. In reality, they're fortresses that are going to be churches, too. So it's a fortress, but it's a church, but it's a fortress. The Gothic cathedrals are the famous ones. Uh, that's in the bottom left. They have pointed arches, large stained glass windows, tall ceilings, these things called flying buttresses, which are braces on the outside of the building so that they can make it even bigger and fancier. All right, the late Middle Ages. I'm going to break this up into two parts. Uh, part one of the late Middle Ages today, and part two of the late Middle Age will be next week along with the, the uh, Renaissance because it kind of goes together. The Black Death. This is kind of timely considering everything that's going on today. Uh, there's a disease known as the bubonic plague that travels from Asia and arrives in Europe in 1347. And this bubonic plague, this Black Death, it travels along the trade routes from China it's carried by fleas, it's carried by rats. Eventually the Mongols get it, and then some Italian sailors get it, and then it comes into southern Italy. This was a nasty disease. It begins with a painful boil or this painful infected lump in a lymph gland. Uh, if the boil is lanced open and drained, you have a small chance to survive. It's somewhere around a 15% chance to survive if you're treated. Uh, you would end up bleeding underneath your skin. Your skin would turn purple. Your skin would turn green as this, as that blood spread. You would start to cough up blood. And then you would go delirious from a fever so high that people were known to just jump in buckets of water, jump in rivers, jump in lakes to try and get their fever down. On average, you died less than three days after you showed your first symptom. And it was a true death sentence. The plague was very, very deadly. Uh, from what I've read, the chances of getting the plague was roughly 80 to 90 percent. Of those 80 to 90 percent who got the plague, 70 percent of those died. Low estimates of people who died from the Black Death in Europe, 25 million. Modern research is starting to show that number might be way low. Modern research is saying that somewhere between 50 and 60 million people in Europe died from the plague. That's a lot of people. Bubonic plague, meaning the swelling of the buboes or the lymph glands. The original plague, 50 to 70% fatal. Then there's septicemic plague, meaning that it gets into the blood. It's transferred by the blood, 100% fatal. And then pneumonic plague, which is aerosol, it was spreadable through the air, 100% fatal. So if you got the plague, you were probably going to die. And if you read the Decameron, which is one of the readings for this week, that gives you a really good example of how deadly it was. Big question, why was the Black Death so deadly? Well, there's no resistance to it, just like there's no resistance to this COVID-19 coronavirus, it's a disease that the body hadn't seen. Um, it had been over 800 years since anything similar to the Black Death had come to Europe. Uh, when it becomes mnemonic, it means it can be spread through the lungs and it can develop into pneumonia. When the plague went airborne, it no longer needed fleas. It no longer needed rats to spread it. It could just be spread from person to person. So the disease mutates to become easier to catch. There's also the problem of hunger, poor nutrition, weakened immune systems, no sanitation. When people use their chamber pots or their toilets of the day, they would just take the toilet and pour it out in the street. 
and was not very, very sanitary. Even today, if the plague is not treated, it is still fatal. Um, if the plague, if you don't get an antibiotic for the plague, you can still die from it. The plague was still something like 40% fatal as late as World War II. Now, there are a lot of reactions to this plague as well. Um, for example, <coughs> excuse me, clerch, church clergy died in very large numbers because for a Catholic to go to heaven, traditionally they have to give their last rites, which is their deathbed confession. So that means the church clergy, the priests, are listening to these people dying of the plague right before they die, which means that they're probably at their most, their most um, symptomatic, meaning where they can really, really spread it. Uh, people are also going to look for somebody to blame. Some people look for scapegoats. And in fact, there is a huge movement against Jews. Jewish people are blamed for the outbreak because they're not Christian. And then there's some people who party, some people who have wild orgies, some people who drink. There are some people who will turn to religion. Uh, there's one group of people called the flagellates who would go through towns beating themselves in the chest with uh, whips and praying. Well, all that did was spread blood everywhere and spread the plague with them. And then there were others who tried to hide from the plague and became hermits, which may or may not have worked as well. Longer term reaction to the plague. Uh, survivors got better land because a lot of people died. There's more food available because there's not as many people there to eat it anymore. Wages go up because there's such a demand for labor. So many workers die from the plague that people can name their own price when work needs to be done. Both England and France have peasant revolts and peasants start to move up in society because of the plague. And earlier marriages, new gender roles, the way people live changes. Now I've got also for you, uh, just to read it out loud, some of the cures for the Black Death. It was believed that you could cure the Black Death by using a vinegar and water treatment. If a person gets the disease, they must be put to bed. They should be washed with vinegar and rose water. There's the lancing the buboes, lancing open the infections. The swellings associated with the Black Death should be cut open to allow the disease to leave the body. A mixture of tree resin, meaning sap, roots of white li lilies, and dried human poop should be applied to the places where the body has been cut open. There's also the idea of bleeding the disease out. The disease must be in the blood. The veins leading to the heart should be cut open. This will allow the disease to leave the body. An ointment made of clay and violet should be applied to the place where the cuts have been made. You also have diet. We should not eat food that goes off easily and smells badly such as meat, cheese, and fish. Instead, we should eat bread, fruit, and vegetables. There's also sanitation. The street should be cleaned of all human and animal waste. It should be taken by a cart to a field outside the village and burned. All bodies should be buried in deep pits outside the village, and their clothes should also be burned. That one actually makes sense. Surprise, surprise. Then there's something called plague or pestilence medicine. And you can see on the right, I've got a traditional plague doctor. Um, a plague doctor might, might tell you to roast the shells of newly laid eggs, ground the roasted shells into a powder, chop up leaves and petals of marigold flowers, put the egg shells and marigold into a pot of good ale, add treacle. Treacle is rotten leftover stuff made from sugar and warm over a fire. The, pa the patient should drink this mixture every morning and night. Then last but not least, one of the cures for the Black Death was witchcraft. Place a live hen next to the swelling to draw out the pestilence from the body. To aid recovery, you should drink a glass of your own urine twice a day. All right, so there are some similarities between the Black Death and the coronavirus. There's no immunity. It is more uh, communicable than a lot of other diseases, but the plague is much worse than what we're going through today. 
Um, lots of weird cures to the Black Death. We may not have a cure right now for COVID-19, but I'm pretty sure that none of those Black Death cures would work, so don't try them at home, especially not the witchcraft. Please, nobody drink your own urine. All right, that's it for today. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.